This is Duke University. often get to tell someone what to do. So I just said, would you stay up here for a second, Dean? So I like to always start, yes, attention, all right, parade rest. Um, I, I always like to start with saying thank you because I think that's a, a healthy thing to do and I think it's, um, it always feels good when you can recognize other people. And I always say that leadership is about the lead anyhow. It's not about, it wasn't ever about me. And, um, and so I want to thank you for what you are doing as a leader of this. And, and people who didn't catch it yesterday or those who are here today and didn't hear it yesterday, the fact that um, you do this without pay, this is heart work for you. Um, I've always found that the most valuable work that we end up doing is our heart work. That's where we grow the most. And so I wanna say thank you for your leadership and what you're doing. Thank you for inviting me. Um, and in the military, we have the history of the coin, the commander's coin. And I don't have enough time to talk about it, but Google it, because it's out there, challenge coin or commander's coin. And when I retired uh, from the army, I, 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 I didn't want to give out pens with lights and you know all that kind of stuff. So I said, I'm going to go back to just minting another coin. And so I did. And just says, thanks for making a difference. And it's always in the shape of a dog tag, because those of us in the military, our dog tags are incredibly important to us. I mean, I think when you wrap those dog tags around your, around your head, that's when that physical, mental, and spiritual all just come together at once. And um, so I want to thank you, Dean, and uh, give you one of my dog tags, OK? So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and uh, Dr. Fagan, would you come up? Because I would, uh, I know you, you're always the last one to speak, and I, I could wait till then. But because I'm in a rhythm here, I'd rather do it early. So uh, you know, I, I can't imagine what it must feel like to know that there's a leadership institute named after you. Um, in, we, in the military, uh, we never want a building or anything named after us because you actually have to die first by the regulations. So uh, when something's named after you and you're still living, that's really great. Um, but I can't imagine how that must make you feel. But having gotten to meet you now and meet your family, um, I bet every time you hear it, you're humbled more than pounding your chest. And, um, and so for the legacy that you've created and continue to create, um, God bless you for that. And I'd love to give you one of my oh, coins as well. God you. bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks Thank for capturing this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to stand over here because I am uh, height challenged. And I did click it once. So it didn't work. Let's try it again. You know what, I know how to do this because I do it all the time. We're just gonna go, we're gonna, that way. Um, so I did a little bit of reflection before I came today trying to figure out, you know, what would I, what would I kind of engage you with and everything. And, and what I thought was very interesting was I found myself reflecting a lot yesterday as well. And so the first thing I wanna do is, is, is kind of give you some of my thoughts from yesterday, if that's okay. Because last night, after that wonderful reception, by the way, and thankfully, I only had one glass of wine, so I was able to reflect for at least a half hour. Uh, I went back to my room, and I just looked over my notes and reflected a little bit. I wanted to bring some highlights out. So, so first of all, um, leadership is so exciting because I kind of feel like there's no real wrong answers. You know, and when the, when the scholars are putting their, their, their programs together, their projects together, and I enjoy talking to you out in the hallway, I always love the fact that there's really no wrong answer because, see, I'm not a scholar. I was kind of 2-0 and go at West Point. Um, thought we were on a 3-0 scale for the first three years and was doing pretty good uh, until I found out I was on a 4-0 scale. But um, so, so when you get invited to come speak at Duke, you have to scratch your head and go, hmm, are they looking for the right person? You know, so, but, but I, I love the fact that leadership is so exciting because there's really no wrong answers, but I will tell you there is wrong execution. Have you ever sat with someone and you share some of the exact same ideals and yet you execute completely different and you kind of scratch your head over that? And guess what? The, those you lead, they get it. They, they, they see the execution. So it kind of goes back to that, you know, talking the talk but walking the talk. And we heard a lot about that yesterday, standards, excellence, and, and, um, and the different competencies. But um, and I think you came up with the number one competency was integrity. Did I hear that right? I know we had this conversation. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about it here. So 
I, I've looked at a lot of surveys on leadership and integrity always comes to the top and for good reason. We want to be around people that we trust, that, has, that have integrity. Not just talk about integrity, but they lead with it, they act upon it. But for me, at West Point, memorizing General Schofield's definition of discipline ended up, for me, also having been in high school and playing sports, so I was the center of my basketball team, so you know that took a lot. Um, <laughs> So, you know, but being disciplined was what it was all about, right? Being disciplined, you follow the rules. Being disciplined, you don't say everything you think. Being disciplined, you are honest and truthful. So for me, the number one core competency of being a leader is discipline. And what I realized, you know, looking at all the surveys, I kept thinking, well, why doesn't that ever pop up as being really important? It's not even one to choose from, typically, on a survey. So one of the conversations I had with the students was I really loved how you kind of gave us very quickly the 33 competencies. And my question really was, you know, were there any that you didn't see that you would like to add? And so I throw discipline out to you for that because I think it's huge. And later I'm gonna talk about physical, mental, spiritual fitness. And I think that discipline really ties to that. And then I love the fact that your domains overlapped because I really do believe in integration. I mean, for a lot of reasons. And, and, and Gus hit it yesterday, but when he talked about you know, how many of you thought about race in the last, while you were listening, and, you know, only a couple of people raised their hands, and I wrote in my notes, well, I wasn't thinking about race, but I often will think about, you know, being a woman. Um, not so much yesterday, but, you know, if you're the only woman in the room, or you're the only woman on the team, and so I think probably I thought a little bit over the years about being a woman the way he thought about, you know, his race. Um, but but I, I always try to turn it from a negative to a positive and say, well, to be healthy about who I am and what I do is, you know, I just wanted to integrate myself, earn people's respect, and be part of the team, and be value added. But I, I had to earn that. So this, this concept of integration and those domains overlapping, I thought was phenomenal. And I think it's the same way with our health. So with physical, mental, spiritual health, it's not one or the other, it's all those things working in, in concert. And I'm gonna talk about health later in terms of that. Um, and the other piece about those domains overlapping is, the first line of my definition of leadership is that leadership is the fusion of heart and mind. So think of that as the intellectual, you know, the IQ and the EQ, right? The emotional and the intellectual. Or think of it as character and competence. But to me, being a leader is all about what's on the inside. And yes, we, you know, we have several generals in the room, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm proud to have been a general, but I'm more proud to have been a soldier. So when, you know, if I'm wearing my retired army pin and people say, oh, you know, what'd you do? What were you in the army? I'd say, well, I was a soldier. You know, because to me, soldiering was a matter of the heart. And that's what leading ought to be is a matter of the heart. Um, you know, and then they, you know, people will eventually get it out of you as to, you know, what you did or whatever. But, um, but and, and, I, and I can't say that that was original. There was a general that I used to work for. And I would always hear him introduce himself to other people, you know, that they said, what are you doing? He had a really short haircut. He goes, I'm a soldier. And I thought, how cool, sir, that you tell everybody that you're a soldier. And then and, and, and it goes back to this concept of a matter of a heart. And then I also saw on the video... Uh, the commitment cards. You didn't speak to it. But I love that because how many of us write down these things that are important to us? How many of you have ever written down your own definition of leadership? I mean, I didn't do it till after I was already retired, and I only did it because somebody asked me to write an article. And they said, throw in your definition of leadership. And I said, I was in the military. They tell us all those things, you know. No, I want your definition. So I reflected and went, Oh, okay, well, what would be my definition? And then I created it based on experience and the people in my lives and serving. But those commitment cards, I thought were really great. Because one thing leaders do is we try to ignite people to action. And if you write things down, you have a much greater tendency probably to follow that. So I also believe in writing down your values. Um, and then uh, you also mentioned transitions. I think the way you framed it, the group framed it was, about being, going to your first job and being the junior doctor. Like, how, what's leadership like at that level and what do you do? And I would expand that to say that, I don't know about the rest of you, but I moved 18 times in 27 years. 
So I had a lot of new teams, a lot of new locations, a lot of new bosses, a lot of new peers. And I kind of felt like every time that I moved, that was a transition. I might not have been a new major, lieutenant colonel, whatever, but I was a new face on the team. I was the new leader. And so I kind of felt like every single time I had to uh, stop and really think about my role and, and, and then and let the people on my team know who I was, what I stood for, what was important to me. And then guess what, the next day, now everybody that comes to your team, they're the new face on the team. And so once a month, I would sit down with everybody that was new on the team so they didn't feel that awkwardness of the transition piece. And I think that, you know, that your model was, was just excellent, as you can tell, because I had all these thoughts as I, as I listened to you. And then the mentorship piece. You know, I, I always laugh and say, I've been mentored and tormented by some of the Army's greatest. And tormentors uh, were just as important in many ways because they helped you. Um, it, it, for me, it most often fell out like this, what I did not want to grow up to be like. But let's face it, sometimes when we're tormented or we get in a, we're the, um, on the receiving end of toxic leadership, if we're too young in our own leader development, we might think, well, that's what we have to do to be successful. And oftentimes, we see people turn into those leaders that they did not like to begin with, and I, I, I don't understand that. You know, um, I have a nephew who was part of an abusive family, and I pulled him aside as a young 12-year-old, and I said, Joey, not your fault, but it is your fight not to turn into those abusive parents, to not be like them. So remember how you feel today so that when you become a husband, you become a father, that you lead differently. Otherwise, you'll fall back to that, and then you know, your marriage will fall apart, and it just will be ugly. So those mentorship, tour mentorship, all, all, all important. But here's the thing about mentorship for me. It is a huge investment of yourself and your time. But candidly, I think I learned more from the people I mentored than they learned from me. You know, when you bring in uh, young people and coach them, they will tell you anything. Is that things you don't even want to hear, right? But if you say, if you were me for a day, what would you do differently? You know, if you were the battalion commander and said, what would you do? And they would tell me. And I'd sit there and go, interesting. Now, if I was a lieutenant, I probably would have never said that. But okay, <laughs> you know, times, of, times they are changing, right? But I, I learned more about the organizations that I led. I learned more about the people. I learned more about their family. You know, when I, now when I look at one person, I see a whole trail of people behind them. You know, the network, the people they've led, their family. And that's the reason why when Catherine and I were talking, I said, I, I don't like just running in, speaking, and then running back out. Because I want to connect. I want to meet people. I, I will go drive back home four hours today and feel like there's a better version of Becky going home than what drove down yesterday just by virtue of the fact that I got to meet so many of you and hear your stories. And I think mentorship really is a two-way street. Rhonda, I don't know if you're in the room or not, but I didn't see you this morning yet, but fathers, you know, oh, there you are, back there. Good morning. Uh, you know, our father's telling us we could be anything that we want to be. You know, um, now I, I know that my father told me that, my mother told me that, as a great source of encouragement, so that when my heart you know, my passion were telling me, go do something that I wouldn't cop out and go, oh, I can't, you know, or I'm, I'm just a girl or whatever. And I think that that's, that helped me look face, uh, f face my fears, is that they did that. But I also learned as a leader, I need to know my own strengths and weaknesses. And, um, and so, you know, I need to figure out what I do best, what I enjoy the most. And so maybe it, we could argue a little, about, a little bit about that you could do anything but, you know, I love to hear people say, oh, I wish I could play the piano like that. And I said, well, have you ever tried? I mean, have you practiced? I mean, you know, most people don't just sit down and they're a concert pianist. They've got to practice. So if you really want to do that, then you need to try to do that and see. But I think, realistically, we do need to know our strengths and our weaknesses. And I remember at West Point, I loved, my favorite sport in high school was basketball, believe it or not. Now, I came from a town with no traffic lights, and we had more cows than we had people. So you can try out for every sport and be on every team and earn nine varsity letters in high school because there's nobody else doing it, you know. And, um, and, but basketball was my favorite. I wasn't the center, but I, I loved it. I wasn't a very good basketball player. I was fast. I could steal the ball. I could run down court. And because I was so fast, I usually got at least two or three shots before I could rebound my own shots before anybody joined me, right? 
And that's what my mother said, you're horrible, you know? So like all summer, practice layups and foul shots, right? But when I went to West Point, the coach said, they put out the word, if you're not at least five foot four, don't even try out. And I have very few regrets in my life, but one regret I have is not trying out because I'm five foot one and a half, and they kind of went out, if you're five, not at least five foot four, don't waste your time or my time was kind of how I took it. So I did not. I was a manager of the basketball team, and I now um, have had the opportunity to teach uh, leadership, share leadership with NCAA women's basketball coaches, and I tell all of them, you know, they ought to make their star players be manager for a day. And they would then learn even more about selfless service and serving others. Because I tell you, to go from a star basketball player in high school to having a towel thrown at you, you know, or a bottle of water, or, you know, never a thank you, brings new meaning to serving and leading, right? Uh, so, so I was a manager, and I loved being with the basketball team. But a bit of a regret that I just let somebody tell me you can't, and I listened to it, and I didn't. You know, kind of a mistake, but at any rate. Um, and the prioritization that you heard about yesterday, I was, I'm a big, big on acronyms because I was in the military for so long. So I have what I call the WIN concept. What's important now? And I didn't learn that until I was preparing to go to Iraq. And in my preparation for going to Iraq, uh, that year I was diagnosed with chronic fibromyalgia. And I'd been put in the intensive care unit at, Lans uh, not Landstuhl, but at a German hospital. And so I was there for about five days. And not once in those five, those five days uh, did I even hear from my, uh, from my boss. Uh, my boss was what I would call a very uh, toxic leader. I did not have very many of those in the military. Matter of fact, most of my bosses in the military, I would walk over hot coals to serve them, to follow them. This was just a particularly bad time in my life. And um, so, uh, so I, I ended up going back and, and uh, getting the unit all ready to go to deploy to Iraq. And, and um, it was, as I said, a very challenging time. And I was seen to be struggling with, you know, what to do next, you know, for myself and my own preparation and the preparation of my unit. And one of my mentors, Colonel T. Irby, I called him, he's back in the States. He's a retired two-star now, but he became my mentor when he was a colonel. I said, sir, I, I, I just feel like everything's coming at me so fast. He said, Becky, I felt the same way when I went into uh, Desert Storm 1. And he said, somebody pulled me aside and said, let me teach you about the wind concept. What's important now? And I've never, I've never left that concept behind. Because change does happen, shifts happen, and, you're, and it's, it's constant. And you have to have a foundation of values and leadership principles that you can depend upon to know how to keep maneuvering uh, and be decisive and to be you know, confident. So I, I, I love the prioritization that was mentioned yesterday. And of course, Gus brought in the human dimension. And let's face it, folks, if we're not about the human dimension, we're not about lead leadership. I mean, leadership is about the human dimension. Uh, one of the lines in my uh, definition of leadership is to effectively accomplish the mission. So I was a logistician in the military. We moved logistics all over the battlefield. And so it was very important to do that uh, in an efficient way as well. And in the business world, being efficient is really important. But I really urge people to, to go a step above efficiency and go to effectiveness. Because, you know, some of our soldiers found themselves in harm's way, even killed, when they went for efficiency instead of effectiveness. And when a logistician chooses the shortest distance between two points, it's because they think that route's going to be faster, but it's the one that has the most enemy activity. You know, and a, it's just a hard way to learn some lessons. But I think when, you're a, when you want to be an effective leader, then what you've done is you've brought the human dimension into the equation. And that's really what it's all about. So I loved Gus's comments. And then this morning for our, our prayer time, uh, those of you who've met Chaplain Camp over the years, um, I actually have not seen Chaplain Camp since I was a cadet. And I was going to insert a picture last night. But he baptized me in Delafield Pond, cold Delafield Pond, uh, at West Point many, many years ago. And, um, and it was a turning point in my in my what I call steadfast faith walk. Um, and so an incredible warrior, incredible prayer warrior is what I, I call him. And, and I think prayer is important and I think we should be prayer warriors for each other. When people know that you care enough to spend your quiet time thinking of them and lifting them up, uh, that's a connection that cannot even be measured. Um, and so I, I'm really glad that we did that this morning. 
So that's my reflection, and I don't think I've used all my time up yet. I, I know I was asked to make sure I, inter I get, get you interested in asking questions, and we will do that. Uh, but I think this piece of reflection is very important. I don't, I'm not so sure we do it really well when we're in that fast pace of our careers. We don't stop long enough to think about what's really important. And I love John Maxwell and his writings, and he says you ought to have a chair, that the only thing you do is sit in that chair and reflect. So thus, as you, as you pass that chair, and you go, I haven't sat in that a day, I haven't sat in that in a week, I haven't sat in that a month, you're probably not spending enough time in reflection. Because in reflection, I think we go beyond ourselves, and we think about life at large, and we think about those priorities. Um, and I think it helps give us some steerage. Because I believe life's all about choices. And I believe leadership is a choice. And in reflection, I think about the choices I've made in my life. And I've made some good ones and I've made some horrible ones. And, um, and there was some very candid conversation yesterday about illnesses and marriage and things like that. You know, I was married and, and now I'm divorced and I have great arguments over who made the mistake, right? <laughs> Depends which therapist you ask. But, uh, <laughs> but I do know that I'm a better person for having experienced being married and sometimes when you're at your lowest po point in life, you grow the most. And I think I've actually been able to help younger people or other people before they make that commitment of marriage, that they're making the right commitment from what I learned and where I failed. And I kind of call it failing forward because if you fail and do nothing with it, you know, then that's probably the true failing. But if you've had a weakness or you've had a struggle and you share it with others, then you can make something really good out of that, and I, and I think that's really important. So for me, I tell people, and I hope I don't offend anybody, but I've been known to offend people, so we'll just build a bridge and get over it, but I'll, I'll, I hope it'll, it'll cause some provocative thoughts and questions. I tell people that it, I don't believe there's any such thing as work-life balance. That if you bought a book on work-life balance, and one time a lady had written a book on it in the, in the audience, so we had quite a Quite a hefty conversation afterwards. But, because I always say, take the book back. Um, I, I just don't really believe that there's work-life balance in the true measure of the word balance. So I think you have to be careful with that word. Um, I, I changed my thinking after being in Iraq for a year, and I call it personal battle rhythm. Again, big on acronyms. Anybody that grew up in the Northeast knows PBR, Paps Blue Ribbon Beer, right? So for the men, they can always remember it because I say PBR, and they remember, oh, personal battle rhythm. But what I was amazed at was in combat, we have a battle rhythm that we establish. And we establish it so that as the enemy gets their vote, we can rapidly, responsively, um, make decisions, and, and you know, the goal, of course, is to keep the enemy you know, off guard, not us off guard by the enemy, but I, we have a battle rhythm that we use. And so as I was training and, and preparing to go, I thought, well, I need to have a personal battle rhythm while I'm in Iraq, because especially with this fibromyalgia now, you know, I, I could really have some issues. And I wanted to try to keep that transparent to everybody. By the way, I never told anybody of my diagnosis until I retired. I had to tell a few senior generals uh, when I submitted my retirement papers because they could not understand why I was leaving. Um, I'm not saying that that was a good thing to do because um, I, I think being transparent and being authentic is really important. Um, but I did not want to be judged by that disease. I wanted to be judged by my decisions and my performance and whatever. And I was afraid I'd get labeled and so I didn't share it with many people. But I, I perhaps have a little regret with that as well. But but anyhow, so when I talk about battle rhythm and I was getting ready to go, I realized that the physical part of my life, the mental piece of my life, and the spiritual piece are all so very important and they are interwoven. So for, I call that PMS and most of the women remember that. Most of the men get very nervous about it. And I just say to you, welcome to our world. You too can have PMS. So, but physical, mental, spiritual. And you know, think about it. And we've been talking about it this morning. When you, 
How many people ran this morning? There were a couple that ran this morning, right? And when you run, it's not all about physical. It definitely goes into the mental and spiritual. The endorphins get going. You start to think about life. And, you know, or, or in some cases, if you're not a good runner, it's very spiritual because you're praying the whole time to finish or not lose your way, right? But there are ways for this to really work across all three. I remember going to air assault school. In, uh, in the army where you learn to repel out of helicopters. And I went in my mid-30s and people said, are you crazy? Said, yes, why do you ask? You know, and they go, well, you're old. You know, only in the army can you be old in your 30s, right? And they go, well, you're not air assault qualified. Why would you go to air assault division? Well, because they asked me to join that team. Why would I not go? Well, you're gonna have to go to air assault school. Well, okay, well, you're short also. I'm like, I'm short? Nobody ever told me I was short. So I said, well, I'll look for some short soldiers who are wearing the air assault wings. You know, surely there's some other short people who've done this before. So, you know, at, at any rate, the physical ties into the mental and spiritual. And I think it's, I think it's hugely important um, how they feed off of each other. And just this whole mental piece of being grateful, of being grateful. Uh, I was asked the other day, um, what do I think about when I'm driving? And I said, well, typically what I think about when I'm driving is just how grateful I am, how grateful I am um, for the life that God's given me, for the opportunities that God's given me. And I do fly a lot. I'm, I'm on the road all the time. And the other day I was waiting for my flight in LaGuardia, and anybody that flies in and out of LaGuardia knows already that's just a horrible experience. But, um, and it was like my third time in LaGuardia in 10 days. And I had a nonstop, so a lot less stress of worrying. As long as you get out, you're okay. And they kept bringing people in to go on our flight, young men, men, in wheelchairs, all of them suffering from cerebral palsy. There were um, 10 of them, and there were four men who were their attendants. And I just watched in awe as these men attended to, the, and I'd say the ages were probably between 25 and 45. And every degree of some could talk, some couldn't. Some couldn't do anything with their hands and their arms. So I thought, oh my goodness, just how powerful. And then um, they put them all on the plane. And I'm seeing it took quite a while, as you can imagine. So we were a little bit delayed. But I had to tell you, to a person, nobody got frustrated by that, which I thought was very gracious. And, and well, they shouldn't get frustrated. Remember, I think probably if somebody had, I'd probably have to say something. But, uh, you know, so I get on the plane. And this is no lie. So I'm, I, I usually do the economy, you know, because I, I need lots of leg room, right? The economy <laughs> up one. And, um, and no kidding, the first three rows on both sides were all 14 of them with one empty seat. And that was my seat. And initially I thought, oh my goodness, I wonder how I'll do. Because a strength of mine is not the medical profession, okay? Uh, uh, I... I always visited my soldiers in the hospital. I tried to listen to them. Um, I, I tried to be a great source of encouragement. But when I would look at the nurses and the doctors, I would thank God for them every day because I could not do what they do. I couldn't do what they do, and I know I couldn't. So I thought, wow, I'm really, I, okay, I can do, whew, deep breaths. And um, so I sat next to Raphael, who is 26, and they're all going to play in the Paralympics in Michigan. And um, so we had about a two hour flight, an hour and a half. And so what Raphael could actually, he spoke quite well. And I had the most lovely conversation with him. Then it came to the time for the snacks, the drink and the snacks. And I thought, wow, you know, he, he only has one hand that operates. And so, so I just, you know, I took the drink and, and gave him the snacks. I said, so I asked him, instead of just doing it, because I, I have to tell you that kind of like what Rhonda said yesterday, I mean, sometimes, you know, um, you, you mean well when you go to help someone, but you can also sometimes offend them. And so I said, well, Raphael, I said, you know, I, I, you do really well, but would you, like me to, would you like me to help you? And he said, yes. And a lesson learned there is it's okay to say yes. There's no shame in that. It's okay to say yes to people and say, let me help you. I, I, I'd like your help. I, I, I did so, do so well in that over my time, but I, I'm getting better at it. So yeah, so I, I helped him with the pretzels and with the cookies, and uh, I didn't do so good a job opening the cookies, and so we had a little bit of mess there, and so I had to do a little better. I gave my cookies, but uh, you know, it, it, but it was an awesome experience, and I thought, oh, the power of gratitude, and I think that's really 
that mental peace and the mental peace. So at any rate, guess what? Shift happens in our life, right? Say that 10 times. And um, I always love to show this picture because I say a whole lot of wrong had to happen for this to happen versus a whole lot of right. But I was on my way to Baghdad and was uh, going around a corner and saw this. And I mean, you have to stop. You know, I learned as a leader, if you don't stop and you don't correct and you don't figure out what went wrong, you just set a whole new standard and it's always lower. You know, I could say, well, I was in a hurry. I was going to Baghdad to see my three-star boss. Right, I could say that. What if next time I go around the corner and I see this picture and somebody's wounded or killed or, you know, and how horrible you would feel that you didn't do anything the first time. But, but this concept of shift happens is really important. But what most of us focus is on the shift instead of on our response to the shift. And I learned that really, really well with the disease of fibromyalgia. I had no idea that I was letting it eventually define who I was. Uh, I'll never forget a great rheumatologist at Landstuhl who actually, um, finally, after a year, he's the one who gave me the diagnosis. And then I left the hospital with a bag full of uh, prescriptions. And I got home and do, with due diligence read every prescription, every side effect, whatever. And I got to this one bottle and I thought, oh my gosh, he made a mistake. He put, either gave me the wrong prescription or put the wrong name in with this prescription. It was for depression. And so I called him and I said, hey, doc, I said, uh, there's been a little mix up. I said, um, you know, you, there's a prescription in this bag for depression. And he says, oh, no I, no, I meant to put that in there. I go, really? I said, do you think I'm depressed? Because most people wouldn't describe me that way. And he said, no, but you're going to be with this disease. And I was like, whoa, you know. Um, so I didn't really believe him. Um, but I will have to tell you that then the next three or four years dealing with it, by the time I made the decision to retire, I probably would have never have admitted it on active duty. But there is a sense of depression that comes with that because it's just you know, because of the chronic pain and, and the feeling of, you know, you can really get into a pit of woe is me um, until you see other people that have it much worse than you do. And on the day of my retirement, I cried like a, like a little girl, you know, um, because I didn't want to retire emotionally. Mentally, I don't think I was ready, but physically I knew I needed to. Spiritually, I knew I needed to make that decision. And I quickly just said, Halstead, practice what you teach. Build a bridge and get over it. You know, there's a reason for this at this point in your life. And who knows what, are, what other doors are going to open. Um, and so then I believe it was uh, uh, General Schoomaker who mentioned his belief in the integrative approach. And I'm so, so in agreement with you. I'm not anti-prescriptions, but I am anti dependency on prescriptions. I am that that's the first thing you give me. I'm anti. I'm much more uh, a believer in uh, holistic and alternative, you know, chiropractic and all this other things. And I got to tell you that within two years, I was on no prescription medications at all. And that was through the help of my chiropractor and the help of an acupuncturist. And it really was believing what I talked about with this physical, mental, spiritual, and putting it all together. Um, I never knew there were foods that warmed my body up and foods that cooled my body down. But when my acupuncturist showed me the two lists, I only ate foods that warmed my body up. And I said, well, you know, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a rocket scientist, but guess what? Uh, I've been, I'm, I'm slowly killing myself with what I eat. And so at any rate, I kind of went through that journey. And uh, I bet you... You gotta have the courage to take the next steps. I love photography, so I like to use nature to, you know, that, that looks like a huge jump for that little chipmunk. And sometimes the jump ahead of us looks really huge, but it isn't. It's just small steps towards victory, little victories, taking the right steps, letting people help you. And when you do that, you have a much better version of yourself. But it does take these things. It takes a commitment to say, I'm gonna do this. It takes discipline, and it takes the right attitude. It takes, you know, no attitude of woe is me. If, you know, for my soldiers who were so horribly wounded, and others in the room can talk to this. But when you go to visit them, and, and they, all they want to do is get back with their team, you know, you feel that guilt of, you know, shame on me for ever thinking that I had it hard, right? And I love that, that we brought up the emotion of guilt and shame yesterday, the two hardest emotions to deal with. But we have to deal with them because that's what so many of our 
are the people who suffer from PTS, and it's not just soldiers. It's not just soldiers. There's lots of people. All your, all your firemen and policemen and, you know, moms and dads deal with PTS. Guilt and shame. And we've got to figure out how to wrap our arms around that and, 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 and not, not let it control our lives. So anyhow, I went through that recovery period. And I like to shoot, use visuals because, uh, you know, I kind of look like death warmed over there in Iraq, uh, coaching one of the Iraqi colonels on the team up there uh, in the northern Iraq. And the people go like, you sure you weren't dead? <laughs> and I'm like, felt dead most days, but, um, but you know, you just got to kind of keep going. And, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not one of these that believes in big makeovers. It's just somebody took that picture, and we, one day we were looking at the two, and there's quite a difference. There's a four-year difference in the pictures. Um, but, you know, I think sometimes we fail to see that there's going to be a better version of ourselves. Because, you know, bad things happen to good people. A chaplain once said, I was sitting in chapel in Iraq, and he looked at all of us and he said, how many of you pray for the storm to go away? You know, he talked about Jesus walking on the sea of Galilee. How many people pray for the storm to go away? And almost all of us raised our hand. He said, what I want you to do is pray to get through the storm. Because we're all going to have storms in our lives and we, we need to lead ourselves through that. And I really believe in making a difference. I think leaders, that's what, you know, a lot of people are successful. But if you can take success and to make a difference with it and become significant. You know, kind of like, you know, the Mother Teresa's of the world versus the Lady Gaga's. I'm, I hope nobody's a real Lady Gaga fan out here, but, you know, I, I think, you know, being significant, helping others, caring about others, that making a difference is huge. And I thought, you know, when I hung up the uniform, which totally had identified me for my entire life since I was 18, that I wouldn't have the opportunity to make a difference anymore, that, well, what would I do? Um, so you kind of re-engineer yourself, and, and now I do this speaking on leadership and share stories. I would tell everyone, I'm a storyteller, you know, but if it can make just a little, a person's life just a little bit better, then hey, then we're making a difference one person at a time. So that is, that is the, the end of my remarks, except to say to enjoy the journey. You know, even when, it, even when it's tough, enjoy the journey, and um, uh, because you're learning something out of it. Something's happening to you today to be prepared for tomorrow. So I probably failed in the uh, interaction part, so I do apologize. I promised Dean I would do better on that.